Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. This is Greg Parra and it's 11.30. So we'll get started with our next presenter, uh, which will be Dr. Hoping Liu of Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. So uh, if you're all set, Hoping. Uh, yes, thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Uh, I have to change my title a little bit to uh, focus on the, uh, this group. So I'm going to focus on the uh, effective management uh, of this lantern fry. Uh, I think I think we should focus on the aggreg aggregating adults before mating on uh, up heaven. And uh, here's my question, you know, reasoning. So before we get into that, I would like to introduce to concept why is the evolutionary evolutionary uh, evolutionary final series? That means the uh, it says the environmental constraints act on genotypes. Well, final all possibility to feel varieties through natural selection. Basically, says natural selection will force the uh, any species into certain kind of uh, uh, genotypes. Another series uh, about is about the metabolic streamlining hypothesis. That means under environmental pressure, species will, will be forced to specialize toward a particular nutrient for metabolic optimization. Uh, we'll see how this, uh, I'm trying to fit in this two series uh, hypothesis into the lantern fry scenario. So as, as previous uh, speakers talked about, lantern flies can feed on a lot of uh, plant species and they will lay eggs on many, many species as well. So I created this uh, schematic. It's not an accurate, accurate representation of the species number, but this is schematic about on the left, you have the stage and time where you can observe them in the field. In the middle is the whole strange or substrate uh, list. On the right is the activities. So for, for example, the eggs will be sown, uh, found in the field from September to May on over 100 sub substrates or species at the first instance, because of the egg where the leg eggs are laid, they will be actually have more than the, you know, the uh, host of subsistence uh, strikes from the uh, eggs because some of the uh, plant species they feed on, they don't actually lay eggs on it. So, but by the second instar or third instar, they will gradually narrow their host range down to a few more, you know, a few species. It's definitely not as many as the first instars and not even as many as the egg, eggs, egg masses. So by the fourth instar, you can only see them on quite a few, like a very, very uh, few species. And by adult stage, they'll gradually uh, turn, uh, disperse back to the Atlantis. And uh, after the feed, uh, defense sequestration and mating and aggregating, they will disperse to other species as well. So eventually they'll back to the uh, over position time and then we'll name more eggs on more than 100 species or substrate. So some of the uh, critical species as the previous, again, as previous uh, presenters mentioned, like walnut, grapes, to have, have, of course, maples at different stages. So the walnut is important uh, host for the fourth instar, but not, not so much on the adults. The maples are like adult stage. So I, I divided the adult stage to four, uh, four uh, different stage from adult. So the question right now is what's the best stage for effective management? So let's, let's take a look at the uh, different scenarios like eggs, Yes, the good news is the eggs are stationary and exposed, and they can last up to nine months. And as Phil mentioned, there's a very good organic oversight available. And actually, the egg stage is an important stage for a quarantine treatment. So it is very important. The bad news is that eggs can found on a lot of substrates. They, can, uh, they are vertically dispersed. And we had uh, some data shows the uh, some of the eggs can be found up, up to 20, 30 meter, meters above ground on the branches, very, very small branches. They're kind of well, well protected with the uh, 
wax on her, and it's, it's it's not possible to do to treat them in the woods even. Even, even on the uh, in the urban settings, it's very difficult to treat high tall trees. You know, if you have eggs on that. But the young young uh, names, of course, they are vulnerable. They are congregated a little bit. They are very sensitive to insect size, and they they are yet to create to result any uh, damage on the plant trees. Yeah, but the bad news is also because they are, they can be found on lots of on lots of plants. And they are actually specially diverse, as I mentioned, that they have even found on trees or plants that not no egg masses was laid on that. And they are kind of like a, a cryptic. They can uh, be found under under the leaf. And it's very hard to cover them if you're thinking about the uh, air replication. So so the, for the uh, older names. The, the host are reduced, they are also still congregated to some degree, and they are still sensitive to insect size. And uh, if you treat them at this point, you can prevent the damage, especially for like grapes or, or some other economically important uh, crops. But when you see this tag, they are more mobile. They are, some of them are up in the canopy, and there might be some treatment side effect if you're treating like a walnut, you know, if you do the uh, Injections. There, are, there are limitations of what kind of insect size you can treat and when can you when can you use. For adults, uh, the adult stage one that's in August, the host is further reduced. They are aggregating on a few host trees. They're also sensitive to insect size and and also if you treat them, you can prevent damage. But the bad news is they are highly dispersive because they are moving back. Back to the host, as I mentioned, like next on the next stage, and and the same uh, question about treatment side effects. So about stage two, the good news is uh, only single host. They're heavily aggre aggregated. They're sensitive to insect size and spray. If you treat at this stage, you can actually prevent them from spreading to other hosts after they have matured, uh, reproductive mature. I don't see any bad news about this treating, treating uh, on the adult stage number two. And uh, number six uh, is the, in o o October. The good news is they're still aggregating, maybe not only on the lenses, but on other trees like maples. They're still sensitive to insects, insect size. But the bad news is they, they have, you, know, you have to consider more hosts and they're going to create some damage through their supplemental feeding, and they're going to stay to lay eggs, which, which will create more generations next year. And there are also some treatment side effects considered, just like the uh, walnut tree, when you treat the maple tree with insect size, when you have maple syrup industry, that'll be a problem. So by stage number, uh, number four, I don't see any point to treat at all. So let's go back to the uh, schematic created. The way I can see it, the, the crucial point is the tree of heaven on stage two. So if we can cut off the populations from this stage, I think we are in good shape. So to support this uh, statement, I, I focus my uh, research on as population density effect adult dis dispersal. And is adult sex ratio density dependent? When, when in the uh, when adult aggregate two or disperse from the tree of heaven, and what kind of potential impact of this, those findings to the management of strategies? So in 2020, we did the uh, whole tree survey for the on the uh, tree of heaven. We did the visual survey from the ground with binoculars, and uh, we found this nice, uh, very okay, you know, population uh, dynamics. The adults start to aggregating on Tree of Heaven by, by the end of July, and then reach to the highest population by end of August. And then, and then started to disperse by the end of September. And it, toward the end, we don't see a lot of adults by November, even, even late October. So in terms of special distribution for the whole tree, most of the adults will be found like below, the, uh, below the branches. So with the lower, lower trunk, it's like two meters above ground. 
and the middle is two meters before uh, to the first branch. So almost like 90% of, of adults we found is on those two sections. And there's a strong uh, correlation between the law or the middle trunk uh, uh, toward the total population for the tree. So, it's, it's, so basically we can use the numbers we found on the two meter or the middle trunk uh, to, to estimate the total number of uh, adults on the whole tree. So based on that, we switched on the two meter trunk sampling for the next couple of years. We also sexed the uh, adults based on the uh, uh, red, red verifiers as, as indicated by the yellow arrow. We also did the uh, check on the reproductive mature, maturation for both uh, uh, males and the females. On the left is a male with expanded abdomen. You can see the yellow areas. On the right, you have two females. The lower one is not matured. The upper one is mature, you can see, as you can see, based on the uh, yellow areas uh, on the abdomen. So we also, uh, in 2020, uh, we did the, uh, we also did some uh, sex ratio, check the sex ratio, but we didn't start until week 34, which is like early August. And we did not see a lot of males for this particular site. So the question was, where are the males? And, it, and in 2021, we repeated that. And this time we, we didn't start until week 37. We still caught the highest peak uh, adult population on Tree of Heaven, which is like early uh, mid-September. Mid and then after that, by late September, the population basically like disappeared. So the sex ratio scenario, about the same. We did not see any, any adults until late September. So the question again, where are the males? So the females mat mat maturation results shows that females matured by uh, late September. So in 2022, we expanded this study to three sites. We have the uh, Memorial Lake, and we have two and there are two sites in Swatana, it's the State Park. And as you can see that the population density in, in Memorial Lake is much higher than and the two sides at the uh, Swatana. And, and then not, the another difference is this, in Memorial Lake, the population started to decline by, by mid-September, and the, two, the population at the two sides in Swatana basically maintained the same, although, since they are much lower compared to the uh, population density in Memorial Lake. So in terms of sex ratio, you know, Memorial Lake still shows there's no males at all until until the end of the season. So where are the, where are the males? And but for the two sides of Swatana, actually you can see males all the time from the beginning. So that's that's what makes us very excited because we think the population has density has something to do with the sex ratio of the adults. And these females actually matured a little earlier at those two sites in uh, Swartana State Park. Uh, those, those two parks are not that far away. It's like a, about 10 miles, less than 10 miles away. So I don't think the climate did have a lot, have a lot to do with it. So you can see the uh, maturation date for those two sites started like early September, but for Memorial Lake, it started like late September. So males, on the other hand, males matured at about the same time based on our, our, our data from the field for, both, for all three sites. So in conclusion, adults in low density population are um, more, than, more stationary through the entire season. They don't move much. They stay on the uh, tree of heaven. Whereas adults in high density populations are high dispersive before reproductive maturation. The sex ratio is close to 50-50 in low population, you know, low density populations. 
whereas sex ratio in extremely female biased in higher density populations, especially before prior to the reproduction, reproductive maturation. And females mature early in low density populations. So that means I think I strongly suggest that we our management effort, if you want to um, effective management effort, should focus on aggregating adults on to have happened before mating. Thank you. All right, thanks, Hoping. There's a couple of questions for you. So uh, how often did you find populations where there is no tree of heaven or black walnuts? I don't know if that was included in your sites or not. I, I did went back to, uh, uh, to a couple of my our old site where it looks like they uh, removed all the tree of heaven. We still find a few egg masses. So the question is whether they completely wipe out the tree of heaven. I doubt they completely wipe out wipe out all the aliases. Maybe there are some sitting uh, sitting. I, I still believe they do need the aliases, a tree of heaven to complete their life cycle, even though some other labs show they can survive and produce egg masses on other hosts along. Okay. And uh see, I know I think Kelly was offering a reply to about females maybe on red maple when you can't find them on Lanthus. There's, they see them move on to red maple as tree of heaven starts to senesce in late September. Yeah, I, I I don't know whether that's the case. I think they're still like for our two sites, they're still staying. You can still find out like the low population site. There's still lots of adults on the on the tree of heaven throughout by the end of the season. I think there's a uh, dispersal back to you know like a, a, from early when they emerged from other in, other holes they they were attracted to the uh, tree of heaven but after the mature like mating after mating after the sexually which uh, before the sexual maturation they actually move dispersed to other hosts like the maples i don't think necessarily they have to leave the tree of heaven to go to the uh, other other hosts like maples i think it depends on the density okay now one person was wondering if you could put the conclusion slide back up really quickly, then I'll, I'll ask you another question while you're doing that. Okay. All right. Just give me a second. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and regarding the spatial distribution chart, approximately how many feet above the ground is middle range of trunk? Uh, if you have like a 10 inch diameter tree, that would be like four meters, I would say. Because we had, because because I I think the trees we use this in the woods, so they don't have like a, a low branches. So we separate them into like a, like the two meters. This is more for uh, practical reasons because. If it's about two meters, I cannot check the sex. <laughs> so just the uh, no, most likely it's like four meters for 10, 10, 10 inch diameter. All right. Yeah, for some reason, I, I'm not sure why on your conclusion slide, I just have the. the oh, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah, sorry. All right. That's all right. And uh, does this indicate that males are more likely to move around than females? I, I do think the males not, does not necessarily concentrate on the on the uh, tree of heaven. I think I think uh, Marion's group had an excellent uh, paper out published in the in the Frontiers in Insect Science. They said like the males their their honey to ex extraction it, actually you, you know the honeydews from males attract males and honeydew from females attract females. So I think that may have something to do with this, you know, bias, you know, sex, sex racial bias. Because um, when when under under high population, the uh, the males may stay on other trees than than on tree of heaven. Maybe there's a different nutrient requirement because because females has to lay eggs. Then maybe maybe they need more nutrients from the uh, tree of heaven. This is just a guess. I have no evidence at all. Sorry. 
Okay. All right. Thanks, Hoping. No problem. Right. There might be some other questions come up too, so just. Okay, I'll, I'll type track. in if I see it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we're is, we're going to switch a little bit uh, to a biocontrol talk because we had a there was a conflict in uh, scheduling. So our next presenter will be Dr. Frances uh, Gomez Marco, who is a um, postdoctoral researcher at University of California Riverside. So whenever you're ready, Frances. Hello, I'm Frances Gomez Marco, and uh, I'm from Hoddle Lab in University of California Riverside. And today I'm going to talk about the proactive biological control project of Spoder Lanterfly in California. Uh, First, about the host range of the candidate parasitoid Anastatus orientalis, uh, that we have found that is highly polyphagous. And second, about the alternatives that we have found using native Anastatus species, the, our new research line. The California Department of Agriculture um, funded these two projects back in, uh, back in 2019 and uh, last year in 2022. After past experiences, Professor Mark Hodel identified Spoder lanternfly as a potential new pest and a significant invasion threat to California. And why? Uh, this is because Spoder lanternfly have invasion brigades that are well established in the northeast of US. And this invasive pest has also shown a rapid spread and explosive population growth in all the areas infested and is a pest uh, of California specialty crops like the grapevines um, that uh, is a very important crop as you might know here in California. I would like to remark that California is one of the most suitable areas for spotted lanternfly to invade in US as we can see in this map. So a spotted lanternfly is coming. It's not yet in California but uh, it might be infest uh, this state at some point. So for this, we decided to center our efforts uh, to do a proactive uh, classical biological control against the spotted lanternfly in California. We centered our efforts uh, with the parasitoid Anastatus, orient Anastatus orientalis. The main reasons to select these parasitoids were uh, because it showed good parasitism levels in South Korea, where the spotted lanternfly is also invasive, and uh, this parasitoid has been used uh, for a biocontrol program. It's an egg parasitoid, and the spotted lanternfly pass most of the time of the year as eggs, as you might know already of a winter as X, so the parasitoid will have a bigger window of opportunity to parasitize spotted lanternfly X. And the third one um, is also because this parasitoid was already imported from China by the USDA to test it uh, as a biocontrol agent in the East Coast. Uh, this work was developed by Julie Gold and Hannah Brolde that uh, she will have a talk later and we'll expand also uh, some information about uh, biocontrol projects. So we honestly piggyback this, all this information that Hannah um, and Julie um, worked on in the previous years. And we started directly to work on the Western host range and behavior of Anastatus orientalis um, um, in California. Yeah. Uh, the results of exposing uh, this parasitoid to the eggs of native fulgorids, we can see in this figure. In red, um, the percentage of parasitism of uh, Anastatus orientalis on our control, Spoder lanternfly, Licorma delicatula. And in white um, is the parasitism rates of non target hot species. We can see that the parasitoid. Uh, can only uh, use Poblitia as, as a host between inside the, the Fulgoride groups. For these experiments, we always, sorry, I forgot to tell this, uh, we always use one female for one week plus honey. The female was mated. Um, 
We also exposed this parasitoid to the pentatomy the family. Um, again, on the left uh, in red are our controls, the percentage of parasitism on spoiler lanternfly, and in white, uh, the percentage of parasitism on pentatomy the uh, host. Uh, and Anastatus orientalis was able to parasitize BMSB, Nezara, and the native Kinavia hilaris. We also tested Anastatus orientalis on eggs of the one of the biggest Coridae in US, the giant back or Acanthocephalatomasi. As you can see, these uh, beautiful eggs. And we have obtained the largest parasito was female from this host, because this host is it's really big. And finally, the most negative news, Anastatus orientalis can parasitize up to four different families in the order Lepidoptera. Can parasitize Erevide, Lasiocampide, Saturnide mods, and Sphingide. Sphingide are very low levels, but uh, it was able to parasitize the X of Sphingide. So, these are not really good news, but I mean, Hannah Broadley will explain a bit more of this later in the biocontrol session, but they have found up to six up different haplotypes of Anastatus orientalis, and we are collaborating to test the non-target host range of these haplotypes in the east and west coast of US. We wanted to know if the difference of these haplotypes on biology on and emergence patterns um, has also differences in the host range. Uh, to advance some results, it seems that the different haplotypes have similar or the same host range than the haplotype C, that is the one that we have tested um, originally. These and other interesting results have been already published uh, some weeks ago in open access, so everybody can access to this information. And after these not very promising results, we decided to explore the possibility of using native parasitoids against the spoiler lanternfly, because here in California, we don't have yet the pest, so we have a bit more time to study this possibility. Um, first of all, we have to take into account that Anastatus genera used to have a wide host range in the literature uh, and the results that we just uh, showed. In the literature, for example, uh, we, we, saw, we saw that uh, Anastatus bifasiatus, a parasitoid of BMSB used in Europe, had a very wide host range as Anastatus orientalis. We know also that the fulgorids large fulgorids are present in this continent, in America and in North America. So we were wondering if are the native Anastatus species able to parasitize fulgorids? And if that, um, if there is some Anastatus able to do it, will some of these species able to parasitize spoiler lanternfly? The big question behind this is that uh, if these native Anastatus parasitoids would provide a biotic resistance against the invasion of a spoiler lanternfly in California. This is why we decided to study the effect of freezing the Corma delicatula-like masses on nymph emergence and parasitation by Anastatus orientalis. Why? Because to look for native Anastatus in non-invaded areas like California, we need we could use um, the, the technique of Sentinel X. But if we lay an egg on a non-invaded area and the nymphs hatch, we might start a new invasion. So we decided to froze these egg masses um, at below 40 Celsius, the temperature that um, is set up in our insectary and quarantine facility. We froze the masses for two different time periods, one hour and 24 hours, and we uh, uh, investigated the, the nymph emergence and parasitation by Anastatus orientalis. Um, after freezing the egg masses, part were offered to Anastatus orientalis. 
In this figure, we can see on the left the percentage of nymphs emerged on unfrozen and non-exposed to parasitoids, what uh, it will be our control. The second group in this graph is the unfrozen egg masses uh, that were exposed to the parasitoids. And um, as we can see, that no nymph emerged of, on any of the freezing treatments, one hour or 24 hours, parasitized and no parasitized. So these are good news, and we can use the Sentinel X on non invaded areas. In this second figure, we can see the percentage of parasites on unfrozen and frozen one hour and 24 hours, spodelante flying masses by Anatatus orientalis. The parasitoid was able to use frozen egg masses at almost the same levels uh, than no frozen egg masses. There are two questions that uh, we could not answer on this study, but it will be interesting to answer for the future of the project. The first is how long these frozen egg masses are suitable for parasit parasitism after freezing, important when deploying these egg masses in the field, and, and how often you need to change the sentinel egg masses. Uh, and the second question is if native parasitoids will be ready, really attracted and capable to use these frozen egg masses uh, as host. Signs of natural parasitism has been observed already in the East Coast. Uh, one of the parasitoid species that hypothetically was found parasitizing a fly was Anastatus redubi. These results um, were um, studied, were um, obtained by the group from, from the East Coast, uh, um, Hannah Broadley and collaborators, and they detected an status redubi by DNA, DNA analysis of eggs with emergence holes that were found in the field. Uh, there has been also some other uh, native uh, parasitoid, uh, not native, um, and natural parasitism, um, the on Sirtos Cubanae that uh, was published by Liu in 2017. We have been able to test up to three native Anastatus parasitoids already. The three species are native from US territory, are parasitoids of sting bugs, and the three species are Telitocus. This is a big difference between uh, this native Anastatus and Anastatus orientalis. Telitocus, it means that they don't need to mate with a male to produce females. It's kind of a parthenogenesis. And this is a big difference uh, with Anastatus orientalis that needs to mate with males to be able to lay um, fertilized eggs that will be uh, females, female wasps. We follow with the same methodology used for Anastatus orientalis, exposing the egg masses to the three different native parasitoid species uh, using one female for one week. And we obtained uh, these not very promising results. Uh, on the left, in red, the control, parasitism, uh, percentage of parasitism um, on Spoderlante fly by Anastatus orientalis. And we can see that only Anastatus redubi um, was able to parasitize um, spoiler anti masses, but at very low levels. We have confirmed in the lab what the team from the East Coast found in the DNA analysis. We know that it's possible that native Anastatus are able to use spoiler anti as host, and we will continue looking for native Anastatus. To, to test or native parasitoids. The next question is, what will be the performance of this first generation of Anastatus redubi with a Spoderlante fly as host? This uh, was that emerged from Spoderlante fly X were bigger. So we, we are testing this uh, new generation, the first generation of Anastatus redubi on Spoderlante fly X to see if the performance uh, will, uh, will increase. So in summary, uh, to the high probability of arrival of the spotted lantern fly and the treat that we suppose for the Californian crops, a proactive biological control program will have to be ready before the pest arrive. 
second, the parasitoid candidate, Anastatus orientalis, is highly polyphagous and can use as host non-target species out of the Fulgoride family. So it might be necessary to evaluate uh, other native or imported parasitoid species for its application in a proactive biological control program. And one of the techniques that we know and we are going to use this season is the deployment of frozen spotter lantern flying masses uh, in search for native or naturalized parasitoids in non invaded areas. And with this, I would like to thank all the collaborators of these different studies that we are working on and to the funders also. And thanks also part to the HODL lab that helped me a lot with all the all the stuff. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Francis. That was great. I uh, don't see any open questions at the moment, but there might be some coming in. So I'll just next presenter will be uh, Dr. Melody Kina, who's a, uh, see, a research entomologist with USDA Forest Service in Connecticut. I think I saw that you were on, Melody. Yes, I'm on and I'm working on sharing right now. Okay. Thanks. All right, you should be able to see my screen then. Yes. All right, so this talk is on spotted lanternfly thermal responses and, and the implications for survival during and after transport. So this is a sort of a compilation of several different studies with some thinking around what might happen when the insects get moved around. Get it to move, there we go. So part of the reason for thinking along these lines is that every year there are new regulatory incidents outside of the area where populations are already known to be established. And as these insects move, the, they're potentially exposed to new temperature regimes where they end up, which could be several uh, kilometers away from where they originated. And so there are some factors that would have to be looked at to see what the result is of once they get there. Obviously, egg masses that are moving around um, are probably pretty stable, and so the conditions under which they um, are exposed during movement may or may not have much impact on their ability to hatch once they arrive at the new location. But for live mobile stages, there may be some implications. So the first study I'm going to talk about is this one, where we um, either used new hatchlings or reared to the beginning of the second or third instar and put them in dishes, the first 10 to a dish and the others five to a dish um, from multiple different locations. Um, we had, um, I believe, 12 different populations that we sampled from for this work. And then we collected adults in the field um, within Connecticut and held them singly. And I'm going to show you the data in just two different ways to look at it. This is the first way where you can see temperatures running across um, the different stages or instars and survival time. Basically, what we saw from doing this was that adults survived less than a week without food, pretty much regardless of the temperature that they're exposed to, um, with them surviving a little longer at cooler temperatures than at warm ones. And first instars um, are the most uh, able to survive longer periods of time without food. And so this might mean that after they hatch, they may have a little bit longer, especially at cooler temperatures, to find food and, and establish themselves. And you can also uh, produce these type of graphs, which are exponential curves that would predict at different temperatures how long uh, each of these instars or stages would survive. And what you can see projecting it this way is that at the higher temperatures, the survival is pretty similar across these stages and instars. But as you get to cooler temperatures, the first instars are definitely um, the most able to survive longer. And as you increase the uh, instar, um, the seconds and thirds can survive less, and then the adults even less time. 
So this may have some implications for moving around, and we've probably already seen this um, occurring where um, adults in particular might end up in airplanes or on ships or places like that and don't survive very long. So another factor that you might want to look at when eggs are moved is you move them into a new environment. Is the new environment going to be one in which there might be winter kill occurring? Um, so I've been working some with uh, Remy St. Amant from uh, Canada, and they have we have a plot of uh, the data coming out of Korea. And you can see forcing a Weibel through that and then projecting that across the landscape. And this gives you an idea of the percentage uh, kill that might be occurring on a um, average winter across the U.S. And if you think about it, spotted lanternfly has generally an average of 40 eggs in an egg mass. So even if you have 50% kill, you could still have substantial numbers of hatchlings. And if the climate was suitable for their development and being able to complete development to the adult stage and lay eggs, you could still have a population. So this could also play a factor in what happens once they get moved. Another thing that could play a factor in what happens once they get moved is potentially where they come from, if there's variation in populations across the landscape. So we collected from 20 different populations across the landscape from five different plant hardiness zones and then looked at their thermal tolerance, um, both the eggs and um, first and third instars. But I'm only going to present the eggs and the first instars today. So we collected the egg masses on pieces of bark. We put them under a hood to dry out the bark so that we don't get mold. And then we proceeded to watch for hatch and counted eggs at the end. We used two different temperature regimes. Um, the first one being this green line that goes across the screen in the middle, um, a constant 15 degrees C. The lanternflies are capable of hatching without any cooler temperatures than that. So this might be similar to a really mild winter um, in a warmer climate. And we also used a simulated Scranton, Pennsylvania temperature regime where we actually every week modulated the um, maximum and minimum temperatures to uh, set up this regime. What we saw happen um, just in a broad context, and I'll show you the actual data in a second, at 15 degrees C, these 20 populations, the hatch occurred over a period of 65 days with some hatching as early as 60 days and others starting uh, closer to 90 or later. And then at the Scranton, Pennsylvania regime, uh, the equivalent of Julian date, the hatch started about the end of May and went into early June, but it was more synchronous. And so here's just a picture of that. We had the cold, the plant hardiness zones 5B to 7B. And if you average out the hatch for each of those uh, groupings, the 6B zone had the earliest hatch. And as you got to cooler and warmer um, zones from that center point, it got slower. So that both to the warm side and to the cool side, hatch occurred more slowly. And then if you looked at it on the... Uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania temperature regime, the alternating one that mimics a colder site, hatch was still earlier at the 6B zone um, than the 6A or the 7A, but not the 7B. Basically, what's happening at the alternating regime is that the variation is reduced and hatch in general is more synchronized. So that the eggs are getting to the point where they're ready for hatch and then waiting for the proper conditions to hatch. And so does this have any reality to what's happening in nature? Um, with the help of Greg Parra, I collected information on first reported hatch dates for various places through, throughout the infested range. And as you can see that in the 6B hardiness zone, which is basically most of the area in the core of the infestation, um, it did occur earlier or tended to occur earlier than in outlying areas. 
So in some respects, spring temperatures may in part explain what's going on with this variation, but aren't likely the only factors involved. There may also be um, maternal effects or, or other things based on population size or host they're using, et cetera. And there's also effects of these two temperature regimes on the ability of these eggs to hatch. So some populations, the warmer um, regime, um, they did much worse than in the alternating regime and others it was much closer. So there are definitely some other effects going on as well. Um, so first in stars, uh, holding that at 15 degrees constant um, temperature, which is a temperature that's pretty normal for spring when they're hatching, you can see that there is substantial variation across these populations and that it really does not correlate with what plant hardiness zone that they came from. And so there's, there's more to be looked at here. Is there anything that we can find that correlates with this? We're only beginning to mine this data set. But substantial variation means that there is something for um, nature to work on, that there's the possibility of adaptation. But if you look at these same first instars at a higher temperature, 25 degrees flat, the variation is much less than you saw at the cooler temperature. So that there's much more potential to adapt to cooler situations than to potentially warmer situations, particularly for the first in stars. And this is just another way to look at it. If we just take three of the populations and look at it, you can see that they all occur, their, their speed of development through that first in star is all about the same at the 25 degrees, but it is significantly different at the 15 degrees. And the implications of this um, if you look under the first under the instar column, those black numbers there are the estimated lower thresholds for development for each of those instars that were reported in the Cretman um, et al. 2021 paper. And then the estimated T mins for these three populations using these uh, data points from this um, part of the study uh, shows that there could be two to four degrees Celsius difference in the lower uh, thresholds, just depending on the population that you're looking at. And this part of the study is recently published in Frontiers, if you want to look at that. This part of the study also showed us that there was temperature interacting with population which also gives us a clear picture that there's a genetic basis and adaptation is possible. If you look at the Pennsylvania population, for example, the, they developed the slowest as third in stars at 15 degrees C, but developed the fastest at 25. So this is, again, a good indication that the variation that's present on the landscape already uh, has a genetic basis, as well as the fact that there's some stability to the difference in, in variation between populations as we've sampled them multiple years from the same sites. And so an adaptation may already have been occurring and there's much potential for future adaptation. There's also um, some interesting findings that are also in that paper that was recently published that all of this data for thresholds is based on constant temperatures. But if you provide temperatures outside of the um, lower and upper thresholds for development for the different instars, as part of an alternating temperature regime, they are able to survive and they are able to uh, develop at those um, situations. So that even though for the first instar, constant temperatures would suggest the range to be 10 to 40 degrees C, um, you can have first in stars that have five degrees C as part of a alternating regime that are able to survive and develop. So this insect does have um, a fair bit of variation and ability to adapt, particularly to the colder, colder end of the spectrum. The upper end of the spectrum, um, as you know, in uh, response curves for temperature, the upper end drops off very dramatically once you reach that upper threshold. And that seems to be the case that they may be more 
uh, sensitive to the upper end of the range. So we are continuing this work to expand it further, collecting um, populations from further north and further south and continuing to recollect from previous ones to look further at the stability of this and to see if there's any further variation as this insect is to move more north and south. We've also asked the question, well, we have found it in temperature zones 5B um, to 7B. Um, and what about cold or uh, plant hardiness zones outside of that range? So we did do a study in the laboratory using a simulated um, Napa, California regime, obviously of importance to California because of the grape growing that occurs there. And under that regime, um, which is in a 9B zone, uh, they were able to complete development. Hatch was in early April and they laid in October, pretty similar to what we would expect for laying here. Um, in fact, it seems to be that the case is that the beginning of egg laying and or mating is triggered by a photo period um, change rather than a temperature change. And so that populations across the range may lay at pretty similar times as long as the adults have reached the proper stage. So for example, if it's a cooler climate, they may take a little longer to reach the proper stage before they can lay. And so they might actually lay slightly later, um, but the earliest laying in any population is going to be pretty stable across the range. And we're, we're potentially going to look at um, another temperature regime. It's actually a 9A because it is a little cooler in the winter, um, but it has some weeks in which there are some heat waves that may be not permissive for this insect. And so we want to see if, if uh, Land and fly ends up in the warmer and drier parts of the grape growing region in California. Does it have a chance of surviving there? And all of this data is going to be um, incorporated into this model that we've been working with Talbot Trotter on. Um, it's a single in individual simulated model. Um, each stage percentage of survival and, and temperature responses and also the eggs and the adults. We're still working a little bit on the egg diapause piece of this, um, but this model, once it is fully functional, should be able to tell when a particular instar is gonna be present on the landscape and also predict where lanternfly may be able to complete development just by knowing the uh, climate uh, conditions. And all of this work obviously takes a lot of people helping both in the laboratory and with finding and collecting egg masses. And the funding for this has come from APHIS through the Farm Bill. And I'll take any questions at this point. All right, thanks, Melody. Here's a, a couple of questions in the Q&A. So the, the first one I see is regarding the, the conversation, or is it there is a conversation going on in the chat? The lower egg mass populations from last year to this year be caused by the trees that were heavily fed on last year having fewer resources? It's possible. We have seen places where we have um, sampled multiple years where the populations remained high. We've seen that their um, egg masses are becoming smaller and hatches going down. And we've also seen that the trees are declining, both the tree of heaven and some birches that they were utilizing at one site are definitely declining. And this all could be affecting uh, several um, biological aspects of the population. And see the next one, do the nymphs adults display any basking behavior? Do they actively try to regulate their development time? Um, Things I've seen in the field, I would say yes to that. I've seen when it's warm, they're looking for a shady spot. And when it's particularly cold, they may be looking for a sunny spot on the tree. And we did an open position study here in Connecticut. And in the fall, when it starts getting cooler, we see them down in the duff, um, the adults trying to, to stay warmer. So I would say that they definitely move around um, to help themselves out. 
you saw the next one. In. Yeah. Do you think that SLF could complete its life cycle in the southern part of the province of of Quebec? That all depends on if there's enough time for them to complete development, reach the adult, and lay before there's a uh, temperature dropping down to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is on Celsius scale, but that's about where the adults die. Um, so they have to be able to lay before that or they all end up dead. Okay. Uh, so far, it appears the populations are low density in Massachusetts. Do you expect these populations to build in density even in the coldest areas? Um, Buildup is going to vary between years based on when the cold spike hits for the adults to die and also how fast they're going to be able to develop through the growing part of the season. Um, we did um, collect egg masses from Massachusetts this year and they are hatching on the earlier end of the cycle, which gives them a potentially a little bit longer growing season. I don't know yet whether they also have the ability as younger instars to grow faster at cooler temperatures, but there could be some uh, potential there. All of that leading to a potentially longer growing season for them. So it, it depends on the year and what the temperatures are doing. Uh, for the modeling of California and other climates, is humidity being considered or just temperature and photo period? So the weekly changes are in uh, day length, humidity, and temperatures. So yes, it is being considered. Uh, do you think warming from climate change increases our susceptibility? I think it just means that where it's favorable is going to move uh, potentially more north. So as northern parts warm, they'll move there. But as southern parts get too hot, they won't be able to tolerate it. Um, endothermia of adults increase adult cold tolerance. I would say that it probably does. And that's probably why they don't die at um, 32. It takes a little bit colder temperature before they all croak. Um, next question have, I have seen what would normally be an egg mass, but when I go to scrape it, there are no eggs under the protective coating, mainly seeing it this year and not in the past seems like a miscarry. Any ideas? Um, yeah, we've, we've seen that as well and don't know exactly why we do see that if they get disturbed, um, they may end up laying their eggs in one place and, and put down their gray material in a completely different area. So things like that could be occurring too. All right. Thanks, Melody. Yeah, that was great. Thanks for answering all those questions too. Sure. I'll stop sharing now. Okay. So we are right at uh, 1230 and on the agenda, uh, the next section of the audience participation. And so I'll turn it over to um, Scott Shermer and back to Dana. Thanks, Greg. And thanks to all the speakers. Um, hearing some really good information and um, look forward to, you know, your continued research and the results that you find there. As we were going through and part of um, this moment is for the panelists to come on. So I am curious to hear you talk about uh, the egg parasitoids and how that's, um, you know, being captured at moments. And Julie Urban and I happened to be in a meeting last week and we discussed this for a moment, but is there a way that this information can be captured so that all the people who are looking at egg masses um, are looking for these eggs, egg masses that might be parasit um, parasit parasitized and has anybody started capturing that? Just curious. I don't know if you were still on, Hannah. I am here. I heard okay. I heard the end of that question, but I didn't hear the first part of it. Uh, can you just ask it quickly again, Dana? Thank sure, you. Hannah. I know a lot of work is being utilized where 
uh, egg masses are being seen. And we talk about the some egg masses being seen with um, that are parasitized. And I just wondered, is somebody capturing that information or giving a key as to this parasitoid makes this kind of an opening um, in an egg mass so that maybe that information can be collected more so that maybe there's more out there that people aren't aware of? Um, so I can answer part of that. Um, so I am actively working on now um, getting out our surveys that we conducted. So we, of course, collect egg masses um, over every winter, and we use that for our rearing for our parasitoids in colony. And we did do uh, two years of intensive studies of parasitoids in those egg masses. Um, we found um, very, 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 very low parasitism um, to date in those. Um, and I also have, I'll be showing some of this this uh, later today, some images of what the emergence holes look like and what we found. Um, I had, when we were doing that, I also had put together a little uh, pamphlet of what the emergence holes of the Anastatus reduvii look like. Um, and Hu Ping has, in his paper, has images of what the other emergence holes, the emergence holes from um, uh, oh, Kuv Kuvenai, Kuvenai, oh, the name? Oh, oh, you said it's Kuani. Kuani, okay. I was like, <laughs> my, my name's Thanks. not quite there. I'm glad no, you were okay. listening. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. But I honestly, I mean, we, with all of our egg masses, we keep track of if there are additional signs of emergence holes or if wasps come out, but we haven't do, done a intensive survey like we did last winter and the winter before. So that's some of the answer, but not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great start. I appreciate that, Hannah. Because that's that's part of what we're trying to achieve is how can we cooperate more? Ho Ping. Yes, yes. If I may, thanks, Hannah, for the answer. I think first of all, it's very rare, as Hannah, Hannah, you know, discussed, because the only so far the only native we call native from the uh, U.S. the only egg parasitoid we found is the uh, or in search is Kwani. And uh, remember what Hannah and Frances is was doing is the actually the species from China. So I don't think we, as far as I can remember, that's the only one I can see. Second of all, it's hard to tell what species, even there are multiple species out there based on the exit hole. They are just rounded, you know, the old walls, depends on the size. Maybe if there's a bigger uh, parasitoid, like a, uh, other than the uh, or inserted, maybe you'll tell by the size. But I don't think you can tell by the exit hole that. So those are the two points. First, it's very rare. Second, it's very hard to tell if you tear apart if you have more than one species. Thanks, and then okay. I will just jump on that again. Just I know this paper's not out there, so a lot of people haven't accessed it yet. But we did compare um, emergence hole size, and we did find, well, back up, we did find that there was anastatus, probably anastatus reduvii using a very, 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 very small proportion of egg masses. Um, they seem like it's maybe a sort of an accidental hit on them or a desperate hit on them, or it, you know, we're not seeing that building up or at least not yet. And we do see that those exit holes are a bit larger than the exit holes that, um, who paying the size that he had reported. So, but a lot of variability and they're fragile and they break and the edges aren't always very clear. So maybe you can go by size because they those wasps are bigger. Okay. And uh, to Hoping and to Hannah, Julie put in um, a question saying, I think it would be good as SLF moves into new areas to develop a combined egg mass uh, database that we could share as a community. So folks like me, meaning Julie, uh, don't um, who don't study parasitoids can contribute to um, contribute data from our egg masses that we hatch out. Would that be useful to Hannah and others? 
Yes, I think that would be useful. Okay. Yeah, she, that, that's a great idea. Okay. And another comment she has is, I think that these uh, data could be limited, couldn't tell who it is, but you could tell that it is. If there is a geographic area where the SLF range expands to overlap with the range of another endemic parasitoid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, possible. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, Can I ask uh, Hannah a question real quick? Sure. Uh, Dana? Um, Hannah, if I remember correctly from some of the information you presented to you, I know it's not significant, but also the the anastatus will also they'll also feed on the, the eggs too, won't they? So I'd parasitize them. Uh yeah, they will. They do feed on them. Both Francesc and I have looked at this a little bit. Um, from the work I had done, I found um the tests I had done no additional mortality from the that feeding. So probably they just, you know, they they probe and then they get a little hemolymph and then they feed, but it doesn't seem like additional mortality is so, caused from that host feeding. And then Frances ran studies as well, and I see he's unmuted, so he can comment too. Yeah, uh, sorry, <laughs> but I step, I step in. Um, we did um, um, some studies uh, with video cameras about the behavior of anastatus on spotted antiflagic masses, and we found that uh, pa the, the parasitoid, the uh, anastatus orientalis is a concurrent parasitoid. It means that um, it lay the eggs on the same uh, eggs that uh, they host feed. They don't use different eggs. So they don't kill, they don't have an extra mortality because it seems that they lay the eggs on the same eggs that uh, they host feed. So, yeah. Can I ask a question, Francesca? Yeah. Uh, when they when you say they're host feeding on the same eggs, they are, they, they are parasitizing. Do they? Do you know they kill the eggs or? Sorry, or can you say it again? Uh, when you say they are host feeding on the same eggs, they are parasitizing. Do you think they kill the eggs by feeding or by parasitizing? <laughs> so yeah, they they, they behave uh, in this setup that we did. Uh, they behave that they go to an egg, they. Uh, uh, are laying the egg or they are uh, inserting the ovipositor mm -hmm. and then they host feed but okay. later they go to another and they come back to the same one that they host feed some minutes ago and then okay. they lay an egg supposedly oh. or they host feed again so they yeah. use uh, it was 24 hours behavior and mm -hmm. in these 24 hours they were like uh, managing between two and six eggs on each egg mass and they were mm -hmm. uh, rotating host feeding or laying an egg so we don't know exactly what they were doing yeah, because we, that, we didn't dissect it yeah does the feeding destroy the egg in any way like did it break the egg at sorry all? can you say that again does the host feeding destroy the egg or or like break the egg in any way no they they insert the ovipositor and they they uh, they have a small, I don't know, I don't remember the name. Um, you can see like a small black point, very, very small black point, and the emolymph come out from there, and then okay. they host it from there. Okay, thanks. From the, yeah. All right. Uh, there's been a little discussion going on in the, the chat regarding where uh, this egg mass reporting might go. And I think that that's probably going to have to be a discussion um, that we have. Um, one of them is su suggesting the uh, Midwest um, oh, invasive species routing network. Um, so again, I think that would have to be something that's discussed and determined because we certainly, it would not be useful to have multiple locations. So I think that um, Greg, maybe that putting that towards um, the working group to try and and come to a consensus on that might be something um, we might want to add to our agenda um, for those. Okay, um, Melody, I do have a question for you. Um, I find the research that you're doing on temperatures um, very interesting and. Do you see the results of your work, your research that you're working on 
perhaps even coming into assisting with regulatory um, actions that might need to be taken um, as far as movement at articles or reaching certain temperatures where we know if, if it's been this temperature, survival is not going to happen. Just looking for if, if you see that your research could be uh, useful to regulators. Melody, are you on? I, I didn't catch the whole question. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to say a name first. Yeah. Um, as regulators, we are always looking for ways to mitigate spotted lanternfly. So the temperature studies that you are doing, I find interesting. Do you think that there is a way that that research will help guide regulatory in making decisions uh, for when things can be moved or if we know it's a certain temperature and it's been a certain number of days, there's no chance of survival of um, a life form of, of spotted lantern fly. Yeah, we could definitely work along those lines. I also have another study I'm going to start um, soon where I'm going to be looking at higher end temperatures above above 30 degrees for a short period of time to see if we can kill the eggs that way. I'm working with a group to do a prescribed fire to see if that is an option in areas for killing both spongy moth eggs and spotted lanternfly eggs. But the side part, the lab part, may also tell us what temperatures that you could expose an article to that has eggs on it and be pretty sure you're not going to have any eggs able to hatch. So yeah, there's some definitely some possibilities. Great. Thank you. Look forward to that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, is it true our SLF populations are likely to the result of a single introduction? And if so, are there any observable consequences, pro or con, of such a narrow genetic basis? Are there any interesting differences between the behavior of the populations introduced to Korea and those to the U.S.? Anybody on the panel feel like they can answer that? Yeah, I'd, I'd throw that out to Julie to see if she was, he would read that or heard that. Okay. If she's been the one doing the genetic analysis. Right. Jacob, I don't know if you can do this, but it might be nice to have Julie on as a panelist. Okay, so Julie's response yeah, is we don't know how many egg masses were on that shipment that are uh, for either Korea or for the US. And each mass, egg mass can have multiple uh, paternal contributions. Females mate them more than once. So, uh, so Dan, Daniel, I'm thinking it's it could be difficult. Oh, there's Julie. Yep, hi. So yeah, thanks. I, I mean, in dissecting females, uh, you know, I've found uh, evidence of at least two to three spermatophores. So they mate multiple times. Um, nobody's done the genetics of an egg mass. I don't know if the temple group is working on that, but um, uh, basically, you know, by the time you figure multiple males contributing to an egg mass, most probably, who knows how many egg masses, you know, where we see, you know, we've seen dumps of many egg masses in one place. And so I, I would be suspicious to think that it was necessarily a tight bottleneck, even though um, the evidence, and it is limited evidence, but the evidence we have to date does suggest that there is still only a single introduction here in the United States. And in terms of comparisons with South Korea, um, I, I'll defer that to, I think, um, Tracy has been there. And so there was a question of, did they see the massive flight behavior that we did or not? And, and I think they did, but I think that um, we don't have great data on those comparisons. But I see she's gone, but I don't know if maybe Hannah could speak to that too, because she's visited with folks in South Korea as well. 
I can only say very, very little about it. I was in South Korea um, end of the season, so in early September. Um, so we were seeing thirds and fourths at that time. We weren't seeing adults yet. Um, and mostly we just saw very, very, very few individuals. Um, and our goals weren't for um, doing observations of behavioral. So I don't have much to add at this time. But uh, could you comment though, Hannah, on the differences in populations though? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, in terms of, I mean, in terms of what, what we consider different levels compared to what they consider, because I know uh, Julie Gould has talked about that before too. Yeah, so our observations were, and I know this is other people have seen other densities, so it may be just very, um, you know, meta populations across the country, or, you know, there'll be little small outbreaks, but where we were, um, so we were um, looking in Seoul area, and then south of there, in Kunsan area, and then sort of in the middle country um, by Chungbuk University, we were seeing, it was hard to find them, and we would find Tree of Heaven, and we would find maybe three or four individuals on those trees. Um, so not many. We are currently running a study now where we're quantifying egg densities um, in the US, in Korea, in Japan, and China so that we have some more comparable data that we can actually say like, well, see, it's like at these densities compared to this. So all I can say for now is just observation wise, we were having a hard time finding um, finding nymphs. Yeah, and Julie, and you did compare to like the other known, uh, yeah, the other known uh, information that's out there, the other analyses that have been done, the studies on the genetics of other populations too as compared to, and I know you compared that to the US population. Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we did that and we had used some microsatellites that were developed um, that from um, a study in South Korea where they, those microsats, those particular genetic loci being looked at, were able to differentiate between three different population sites in South Korea. And so those um, researchers sent us samples of S SLF from those population sites, and I compared it to the very limited data I had at the time from China and then specimens from the U.S. And what we showed was that, um, you know, Yes, those microsatellites differentiated the South Korean populations, but there was really no match of the U.S. populations to South Korea. That was one thing. It seems like, okay, they didn't seem to come from there. But those particular um, genetic loci weren't variable across the U.S. samples that we threw at it. And we had overall, I think, like 200 U.S. samples. And so um, there's an additional set of samples that have come out additional new set of loci that were developed from um, a group in China. And using those, we are finding variation in the US samples um, that, that can kind of be useful to potentially track things a little bit better. And I have a better sampling of Chinese populations. Those analyses aren't finished yet. And so, but to date, anytime like we've gotten um, samples set, sent to me from uh, new introductions that pop up, we don't really any see any signal that those stand out as any different. But that said, you know, I think the the full story is still out with these with these new microsats that we're working with. And Tracy's back on now too. Hi everybody. I'll yeah, I'll I'll kind of follow up and and just add some more to what Hannah and Julie were saying about South Korean populations. Um, interestingly, when we were there in 2014 for a brown marmorated stink bug study that we were setting up, um, that was when they were kind of at the peak of uh, populations throughout the country. And they had literally, high, I had no idea, um, I should have paid more attention back then, but um, they had hired just locals to scrape egg masses on poles all over the country. And the first time I saw it, I said, what is that? And they said, oh, it's another invasive species. We have spotted lanternfly. And so, yeah, they were kind of everywhere then. By 2018, that was my last time there. We were in different parts of the country, but the one that stands out, and it just kind of uh, emphasizes what Hannah was saying, 
uh, we were in the Seoul Arboretum looking for um, SLF and looking at some of the impacts on things like Manchurian um, walnut. And it was hard to find an egg mass. You might find one or two on a, a key host plant, but they weren't particularly numerous. But what some of the Korean scientists told me was at the time when those populations were higher, they were seeing uh, mass movements. But again, they were on kind of, you know, where it was less of a problem when, when, I, when, when, when I was there last in 2018. I'll just add to, we did talk to growers, grape growers. Um, uh, it was information translated to us, so we may have missed some of it, but they were saying that spotted lanternfly is a nuisance for them, um, but they spray routinely um, and they spray routinely at this point anyways, because they also have met kaffa as an invasive insect there. So they, people we were talking to were saying like, oh yeah, we, you know, we got used to, or basically we got used to spraying for spotted lanternfly. We were thinking of not doing that anymore, but now Metcalf has a problem. So we continue spraying. I mean, that's just talking to a few people. Again, not a big data set of information, just a couple of conversations we had there. Hey, Dana, this is Scott. I don't want to, um, take this too far off off track because it's been a good conversation. But when I read Daniel's initial question, you know, I kind of thought about, I didn't think about the initial introduction into the country, but I thought what we've seen subsequently um, from, from state introduction. So I was looking and I see, I know you and Pierre are on, um, and I was wondering if there was any comment on that from your perspectives as far as once it's in the country, how we're seeing it move. Because I would say probably yes, single point introductions is what we're seeing from, from artificial spread, but um, not necessarily um, anything that I would consider more like natural spread, so to speak. We're, we're, it's more of an artificial spread challenge, correct? Well, yes and no, um, because we are now, Scott, starting to see more of a natural spread sure. situation um, because we have, we'll have a county, um, like we just called a couple of counties and it wasn't that it was this, an introduction that was moved into the county. It was, it was side by side with another county that had a municipality and that had spotted lantern fly and it, it just naturally spread over uh, that border. So we are starting to see that more. It certainly is not at the rate um, that we see like a single introduction. And I've given the example before uh, downtown Harrisburg is about 30 miles as the crow flies from my home. Um, it takes me about 45 minutes to get in, to, to Harrisburg from my home. Um, it was introduced, I think it was 2017, we found it the first time. I did not find spotted lanternfly anywhere near my home until last year. So it took several years for it to make it from downtown Harrisburg to the upper portion of the county where I live. And we had populations kind of bearing down on the corner where my, my home sits. So spotted lanternfly do move naturally, but it is not um, very fast at all. Um, I think some observations have been made where they get into an area where it's thick with with Tree of Heaven, and they just kind of sit there and and just take advantage of not having to work very hard um, to move out of that area. Um, and please, anybody else who's um, been involved with, with any of those, Julie, um, I know Penn State's seen a lot of different things going on, but from my perspective, um, the, the transportation methods uh, those are the ones we just have no clue where they're going to happen. Uh, but the natural spread, I think, is something that could be tracked. Okay. Yeah, and I know I know Pierre is going to cover this, uh, the artificial component of it later yep. on. But um, yeah, it was an interesting perspective there, Dane. I think that was that was something that you have the unfortunate uh, uh, frame of reference that that most of us do not. Um, real quick sidebar here: there was um, uh, 
uh, comment that was made, and then I got a separate email here about uh, cold tolerance studies and, and uh, a rumor about a Canadian um, government official working on that. Is anybody aware of partnerships or collaborations or anybody in Canada that might be working on, on similar work? I, I don't know who it is. I forget actually right now, but I know that uh, John Rost, who is a, a technician who works for us out at Penn State Berks, he's been collecting egg masses this year for them and they are exposing them, um, I think at various latitudes to, to various, you know, more um, cold temperatures in the field in Canada. So I don't know the name of the person. I think her first name's Amanda. I don't remember the, the <laughs> yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, it's Thanks, Amanda. Julia, asking you shall receive. And, Amanda just chimed in and said that would be her. So we got it. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Perfect. Dana, I was going to add, if I could, to yours. I think I think the issue is that because um, there's different, you know, it's it's hard to track the natural dispersal um, of any one life stage because it's cumulative. They're constantly moving, right? right? And it's it's usually mixed with some hitchhiking. But I and I think Brian Walsh has some good estimates that kind of match some maps. But I, I think the other main issue with that is that they're just so incredibly patchily distributed that we had movement, for example, back into um, Vinecrest last year, and they had numbers down their whole year and the year before. And so they moved back in um, from who knows where, but then um, neighbors like less than a mile away were convinced that they hadn't seen any lanternfly move back in at all. And so it's just that patchy, patchy distribution, um, I think more so than I, I'm just hesitant to to it, interpret that as meaning limited dispersal, because I think we're underestimating their dispersal. I, I think to say it's patchy, that it's highly patchy, but they're highly mobile is the safest way to like summarize it. I, I, I like how you put that, Julie, um, because the other thing is Pennsylvania is um, very unique and um, the different levels of um, elevations that we have because I know that at my home, I run 10 degrees cooler than I do, than Harrisburg does. Um, so yeah, they, because I live farther up in the Appalachia uh, from ha Harrisburg. So there are many nuances that have to be considered yeah. um, when, and, when you're looking at distribution. And I think that why State College isn't, isn't has as densely um, infested with lanternfly, whereas Harrisburg to our east is and Altoona to our west is and has been, is because right. the train line doesn't run through State College. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts here? Still have a couple more minutes. I just had one thing real quick, Dana, because I try and work with Julie on this as much as I can and with the states is when, unfortunately, when SLF does show up in a state, we try and work as much as possible to get a leg at least to Julie uh, so she can continue her DNA analysis. And that's just to continue to see, you know, if there's any anything different shows up within the population, but it's also to understand, because the assumption is always that it's from the populations that, that's here, but it'd be really important to know if we had a separate introduction also. So. But I try and make those requests out to states. They would really try and like it's all all you need is a leg, right, Julie? Sorry, I hit my microphone. Yes, that's all I need. They're big big bugs, so a leg a leg will do. Yeah. And just going back to Korea real quickly. You know, I'll shoot off questions to like different people that I'm in, we got in contact with early. Uh, to bounce things off of them or ask them questions specific to spotted lantern fly. So I know when that flight was observed at first, and we, you know, threw that at the um, Korean researchers to see if they'd observed that, and then they came back and said yes, that that was something they'd observed too. Was also and there was just a, you know, these larger flights that they didn't see in the beginning, but again, it's probably related to population levels. But then, um, you know, of course, we knew about the grapes, but. That's the only reason that I still have a question mark over peaches in my head, uh, just because they can 
they continue to bring that up that that was also an issue with them was peaches so so far it seems like it's done you know over time kind of for and some of the main observations in in korea it seems to have happened you know while it's been here but it just hasn't hit some of those areas where there's large production of peaches and greg this is tracy just to add to the peach thing we'll be writing up this we're writing it up now but we did see on non-bearing peaches on young peach trees after um feeding um throughout the season and it's it goes along with the grape story um we saw uh some reduced growth and we also saw more susceptibility to frost injury in the spring from those that were fed on by lanternfly so it's probably similar mechanisms to where we see this potential um situation with winter injury in grapevines so and I couldn't remember if it was you, Tracy, that said this, or it was uh, Julie Gould when I was talking to her, but I was trying to uh, compare the population levels that they were, um, somebody had told me that what the Koreans consider high, medium, and low is different than what we consider. Like their high would be our, our medium here, or their, sorry, right, their high would be our medium here. Like our population levels are much higher than what they experienced or saw. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think Hannah unmuted, so she might have a better sense of this. Yeah, I think you're referring to there, Greg, you're referring to China, actually, I think. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, you're right. We yeah. had collaborated on a paper reporting where SLF is across China. Um, that's the Shin et al. 2020 paper. And they uh, their scale of what's high, medium, and low is, just as you said, is one step lower than what our scale of high, medium, and low would have been. So I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Well, Tracy, I'm going to go back to the study that you were talking about with peach. Um, are you seeing that with apple as well, or just is it no. mainly peach? It okay. was just peach. Apple, they had no impact. We think a little a part of it is maybe just the, you know, especially with the younger instars, the bark is so much harder on okay. apple that they probably have some trouble feeding on them. But so no, it was completely different. And, you know, of course, the weird thing is that in our laboratory studies, peach doesn't support great development. So, you know, they would have to keep reinfesting a planting for this to potentially happen. But, but it definitely did. So, yeah. That's interesting. Um, do you think it would transfer to all stone fruit? I mean, it, you know, I, I think about, you know, there are just so many unknowns with the insect and we're still learning, but, you know, what's the impact going to be on almond or avocado or something like that? So, yeah, I don't know. Um, and Dan asked about the frost injury. So it was what we did, we had a certain number of nymphs and um, through the season, and then we moved on to later nymphs and then to adults that fed on. And so probably mainly from the adults, Dan, just based on their size and their ability to feed, but I, we can't say that for sure. So, so I don't know, Dana, I don't know. Still a lot of, uh, still a lot we have to learn. Yep. 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 So, all right. Well, if there are no additional conversations or, or comments at the moment, uh, we can go ahead and start winding down for lunch.